Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for taking the time out of your day to participate in this webinar. <laughs> it is my uh, first live webinar, so uh, go a bit easy on me, would you? A um, bit of background. So my interest in gliders is it's kind of more of a fascination, really. It's been pretty much lifelong. Um, I was fortunate to grow up in Eltham North back at a time when uh, there were still extensive areas of bushland and the backyard of my house was linked to quite a large area of box stringy bark woodland. You know, it had the understory of native grasses like the silver top wallaby grass with red box and red stringy bark. Back then, you know, we had grailing grass frogs still hunting along the Diamond Creek. Uh, it, quite often I'd see button, painted button quail darting around in the backyard amongst the uh, wallaby grasses. It's a pretty special time. And it had quite an influence on me. Today, and unfortunately, a lot of that vegetation, of course, is no longer there. I still actually live on the same property. Um, got plenty of red box trees, which seem to persist in the urban environment. The red stringy barks have died out. And look, the understory, it's not what it used to be. No, no orchids there anymore. No painted budded quail but uh, it's still a beautiful place to live. And I still have sugar gliders. In fact, most nights the gliders launch themselves from red box trees in my backyard and glide over the neighbor's swimming pool. Uh, it's a great show. And uh, I've had many a guest be delighted to see them and surprised. Uh, there's actually a spotted gum that my father planted out in the front yard and when it's in flower, we get the grey-headed flying foxes coming in and also sugar gliders competing with them for the nectar and pollen. Uh, all right, but I'll get on to some, get on to the talk, enough about me. So I'm going to cover a few key topics today, uh, some facts about sugar gliders, uh, like when they breed, their habitat requirements, I'm going to talk about nest box monitoring projects, which is a particular passion of mine. I'm going to identify some of the issues as well as the positives with these projects and talk about a key issue for gliders in our urban landscape, which is crossing of roads. So gliders are called wrist winged members of the family Petoridae. So there's about 23 species in total. 11 of these occur in Australia. The rest are in Papua New Guinea. Uh, there has been a recent study that looked at the genetics of the gliders, of sugar gliders in particular, and uh, has posed some changes to what we now call the sugar glider. Uh, within that group of related possums, we've also got striped possums and uh, leadbeater's possum. So they're quite closely related. Leadbeater's possum does look a little bit like a sugar glider. Uh, they have got similar stripes. Uh, males are heavier than females. They're, they weigh about 140 grams. The females about 115 grams. In the wild, they can live for about eight years, but in captivity, they can live for 12 years. And some people do keep them as pets in Australia and overseas in, in the US. They're popular. Uh, I guess you call them pets. They, not like a dog or a cat, they definitely stick to their nocturnal life cycle. I actually bred them for many years. And each evening I would let, let them into our lounge room and they would run upside down along the rough sawn Oregon beams in the house and land on your head or on your shoulder, usually when you didn't expect it. Unfortunately, though, they're pretty keen to play and um, get active at about the same time that you want to go to bed. So not an ideal pet. And uh, then, of course, there's their, their urine. Oh, my God. It is so concentrated. It's amazing. They're mammals like us. So when they first get up which in the evening, uh, they come out of their nest box, take a stretch and have a pee. But not, 
they're not they're not like us in that uh, they they're very well adapted to a dry environment. They don't they don't like going to ground, so it's not like they head off down to the creek to have a drink each night. They get their water from their food, from dew droplets or maybe a temporary puddle in the fork of a tree. So because water is so precious to them, they've developed this highly concentrated urine. And I mean, it, it's like treacle. It leaves this tacky layer on surfaces in their in their enclosures and I'm sure throughout their environment. And the set, the smell is uh, pretty distinctive. Um, so if you're thinking about having a sugar glider as a pet in your house, uh, unless you and your housemates are extremely tolerant, I, I suggest you don't invite them into your home until uh, perhaps after they've had their evening pee. But back to the facts. Uh, so, the membrane is called a patagium, and that that's runs between the wrist and the ankles, and it's uh, it's dark above, and it's got a white fringe, and it, they're very pale below. They call it counter colouring, which is pretty common in um, a lot of animals, fish and birds of prey. Being pale from underneath, if a predator's looking up, it, the, they kind of merge with the sky and dark on the top of them, body means that when they're viewed from above, they kind of blend in with the ground, or at least they hope to. They can glide for over 50 metres, but depending on their launch height, so depending on the vegetation they're in, how high it is they can take off from. Uh, but on average, you'd expect them to glide about 20 metres, particularly in an urban environment. In southeastern Australia, they usually begin to breed in June or July. Uh, they have they have twins. Uh, not they don't both necessarily survive, but um, you you start seeing them the the young about August, September is a the main month. They remain in the pouch. For about 70 days so the female has to actually move through the landscape with the young in her pouch and then once they are able to be left in the in the nest they they spend about 50 days just without leaving that that nesting hollow before they venture out i have seen them out in the environment just young just taking their tentative first steps exploring their world When they do start getting out into the environment, it's a time when they can uh, they can turn up. So I've found gliders during that time when the young are starting to disperse. I've found dead ones on the ground below trees that appear they appear to be perfect. They just died for some reason. Uh, it's relatively common. I get I get uh, reports from people about that time of wondering why they've got a dead glider in their backyard and that seems uninjured, hasn't been attacked by, by a cat. So unfortunately, animals suffer from accidents too, so it's most likely a gliding accident. Young males actually remain for about a month with the colony, but then, sorry, about 10 to 12 months and then they're evicted from the colony. They're not welcome to hang around with mum and uh, and the sisters. Whereas uh, the females, the the new females, may well stay in the maternal colony if there's enough room. That is, we've got about seven some subspecies of sugar glider, with four in New Guinea and three distributed across northern and eastern Australia, from the Kimberley through Arnhem Land, along the east coast of New South Wales, through most of temperate Victoria and the southeastern corner of South Australia. What we call sugar glide has actually been split recently, or proposed to be split, into three genetically distinct species. 
so instead of subspecies, it's been proposed that we now have the sugar glider, which is restricted to a patch of um, the coast on e eastern Australia, and two new species. One of those is the crefts glider, which occurs in Victoria. And if you look at this distribution map, the crefts glider, which I must say doesn't have the same ring as sugar glider, I'm not sure I'm going to start using it anytime soon. Um, they occur right up from Victoria up to the top of northeastern Queensland there. And then over here we've got what they're calling the savannah glider of northern Australia. So the savannah glider, you can see, is, is, it's separated from other species by, by the Gulf country here. Uh, the other two, though, the other two species, which we currently call subspecies, they look like they they kind of meet. Their distribution meets along the Great Dividing Range, which range, which suggests that they would interact. Not an ideal situation if for new species to form, but uh, I can only assume that they spent a long time separated. So the Great Dividing Range must have split the species along this area, probably during a glaciation event like an ice age that that would have made the, the highlands of the, the Great Dividing Range perhaps impassable or difficult to pass for gliders. And they may have been separated for long enough that they became genetically distinct and, and maybe um, developed different breeding patterns, like perhaps females of crefts breed in a slightly different period to the sugar gliders. It's hard to say. As you can see, though, Tasmania is also included here in the distribution map. And many of you might be aware, because we humans can't help ourselves, we actually introduced sugar gliders into Tasmania back in 1835. And they spread quite rapidly over most of the state. So this has led to a disastrous interaction between the gliders and nesting swift parrots. So swift parrots are an endangered species of parrot that breed in Tasmania and then fly across Bass Strait to Victoria, particularly Western Victoria here, and feed. So during winter, there should be around now. There's not many of them left. And unfortunately, while sugar gliders are very cute, they are omnivorous. And it appears that nesting birds are definitely on their menu. So they have been associated with uh, the death of many young swift parrots. I've actually heard of sleeping birds being preyed upon by sugar gliders as well. Now, up here, around here in northeastern Australia, there's a place called Tully. There's actually a cool glider there known as a mahogany glider that overlaps in distribution, but it's it's much larger. It, in fact, it looks like a kind of a tea-coloured sugar glider, but really big, about two times the size. They were thought to be extinct for a long time until they were rediscovered back in 1989. But not knowing that gliders are around is not surprising. I'm not surprised that a glider like the mahogany glider that inhabits these remote forests might have gone under unnoticed for a long time it's pretty common for me to speak to people who aren't aware that sugar gliders are in their backyard possibly every night i know in montmorency um when i brought this up at a at a talk to the biodiversity group many years ago now back in 2014 uh, there were very few people there that re realized that gliders were actually in their backyard. Not everyone, though. I'll just... Can people see this video? This is a video from 2005. Oh, might mute it. Can 
hopefully people can see the video. Not coming up for me yet, Richard. That's all right. I, as I said, I am. Uh, Not I've coming my... up for me. And can you speak a little bit louder, please? Certainly. Thank Here we you. go. I'll try that. How are we looking now? Yes, I can see it now. Excellent. Okay, speaking at the microphone. Bit of a challenge. So this is a video from a property from 2005 that was kindly uh, given to me by a resident. And this is a sugar glider in what the resident thought was a parrot nest box. But you can see here in this video, a head appears out of the box. And he was quite surprised to see he actually had a sugar glider. So being a retired engineer with some resourcefulness, he put a camera in to see what was going on. And this glider was in the box, happy enough, cleaning away when, hello, these are rainbow lorikeets that turned up and uh, realised that there's an unwanted guest in their box. So the glider didn't eat them, so obviously may have felt outnumbered or taken by surprise. Um, and they kind of got along okay for a while. If I skip along to 2 minutes 20, the, the parrots even fell asleep on top of the gliders, but uh, the glider, but when it moved, they certainly weren't happy. <laughs> and uh, they were pretty keen to see it go. Uh, Richard? Yep. We've just got a question here. It says, do they make a sound that we might hear if we don't tend to see them? Sure. So when you actually get to know the sound, mate, the call of a sugar glider, you'd be surprised how often you hear them. They make a, a small, uh, like a yip, like a, like a small dog bark, just like a yip, 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 yip. And it can be very persistent. Uh, I hear them in my backyard quite regularly while I'm lying awake in bed. If I'm thinking about things I probably shouldn't think about, I should be asleep. Um, and whenever I'm in parks, um, it's very common to hear them. So if you get your ear in, um, you'll be surprised how often you'll hear them. And once you hear them, of course, you can find them. It's pretty cool. So this glider did leave with some encouragement. They gave it a bit of a nip. Um, don't come back, thanks. The owner of the box actually ended up uh, putting a plate over the front of the entrance so that the parrots couldn't get back in. He decided he'd like to have gliders for a while, which was pretty cool. Okay, now. Sorry, Richard. Yep. Just got um, one more question or comments. Someone's asked uh, if they assume this is a male glider given the scent gland patch on the head. Yeah, that would be correct. Great, good spotting. Okay. Yes, nicely done. All right. So. You can see from the map, they've got a really wide distribution and they cover a lot of different vegetation types. In, in Victoria, they occur through most of the wet and dry forests and woodlands. Up here in the, in the Mallee region, they're absent, well, largely absent, quite uncommon, north of the little desert at least. And that although they do occur through this, the, the Victorian volcanic plains. It's, it's quite patchy. Um, so 
there's a lot of areas, of course, which don't have much tree cover or the tree cover is very widely spaced, which is not well suited to a gliding animal that wants to glide between trees. Around the greater Melbourne area, um, they are surprisingly common. If, if you've got connected treed areas along waterways, uh, right through urban areas, through people's yards, if you've got some patches of remnant bushland or planted native vegetation, they're known from Mor the Mornington Peninsula, right through the southeastern suburbs. They occur right down the Yarra through Melbourne in the eastern and northeastern council areas like Yarra Ranges, Knox Council, Maroondah, Manningham, Nillimbic, Banyul, Darabin Council. And they were actually reintroduced to the Organ Pipes National Park up north of Melbourne on the Jackson's Creek. There is a closely related um, species called the squirrel glider that occurs just north of the divide, has an overlapping distribution. They look pretty similar. The, the squirrel glider's got longer hair on its tail. It's got like a bushier tail. Um, in the, the forests and woodlands they inhabit, they, they're definitely most abundant when there's dense stands of acacia around. They, they're pretty big on uh, acacias because they provide uh, insects, pollen, and some exudates, some, some saps that exude out of them, particularly things like silver wattle, black wattle, and golden wattle that, that produce that, that gum. And uh, at certain times of the year, they eat that. They, they can persist along roadside remnants, so really move through the landscape. They're really quite adaptable, and that distribution map shows they, they really occur in such a wide range of habitats. They're, they're very adaptable. Um, around Victoria, they, they, they're most common in that, that stringy bark box, iron bark, um, gum barked eucalypt forest with, with acacias, black wattle, silver wattle, and golden wattle, as I mentioned. A, a large part of their diet is the gums, and not just from acacias, but from eucalypts as well. When I was out spotlighting one night down at Moggs Creek, down near Anglesey, we actually observed sugar gliders following yellow belly gliders. The yellow belly gliders will chew into the bark of trees and release a heap of um, manna from the tree, which the sugar gliders and even feather tail gliders will feed on. And during the day, you'll see um, honey eaters and butterflies feeding on it too. Uh, they, the gliders, they, they were a little uneasy, I must say. They were keeping an eye on the on the yellow belly gliders. The yellow belly gliders are quite a larger animal, pretty uh, vocal too, if you've heard them. They're, they're more reliant on things like the, the saps and manna during um, autumn and winter. Bit of a sugar hit, I'd say, but also some of the other uh, insects are less common and less nectar and pollen available than, say, spring or early summer. So you'd expect that they're right into their nectar and pollen. Um, so that's, that's going to be a major part of their diet through spring and summer. I've, I've seen them in the front yard really jostling with the uh, grey-headed flying foxes. It's not uncommon to see several different animals are having a go at uh, the nectar and pollen on trees at the same time. Uh, there's, my father planted a spotted gum, and when it's in heavy flower, the, there's grey-headed flying foxes, there's moths, there's beetles, there's gliders, all, all competing for the... Uh, sap and nectar, um, pollen. This time of year, uh, in fact, last last Thursday night I was up in Warburton and it, the yellow belly gliders were extremely vocal. So uh, if you haven't heard the crazy uh, calls of yellow belly gliders, you really must look into it. I'm sure there's stuff on, on the internet, but head up to Warburton when we're out of this lockdown, of course. Get up into the damp and wet forests and uh, check them out. 
if you can hear them, you'll spot them. And they, they do amazing glides. They can glide for 120 metres through the air, taking off from the big regnans. But back to the sugar gliders. So, yeah, the gliders, they can glide for 50 metres, but the research suggests that particularly in urban areas, 20 metres is much more common. Um And so we should plan for that in our urban landscape. This photo is some typical glider habitat from northeast Melbourne. This is actually One Tree Hill Reserve. It's a box stringy bark woodland. That's the the silver top wallaby grass I was talking about earlier. That's common to this area in good quality habitat. This has actually got quite a lot of species in it. This this particular reserve, and there's uh, the fascigale, brush-tailed fascigale and sugar glider co-occur here and those two species actually like very similar nesting sites so they they compete with each other for hollows and uh one night while i was out spotlighting with some friends in one tree hill reserve we actually saw uh, a sugar glider and a fascigale fighting out in the open on a tree it was particularly cool i never expected it but um, though it's pretty risky behaviour, though, because there's plenty of powerful owls and barking owls in the area. So, you know, both both gliders and fascigales would be a tasty snack for owls. Um, so a glider colony is typically about, well, two to maybe seven adults in a den site. Um, there can be up to 12 during when juveniles are in the box as well or in the hollow. Um, on one occasion, I actually did count 12 in my in a nest box in my backyard. But um, you tend to get the highest number during summer, which is unfortunate for the gliders. It's pretty hot. And I can tell you that 12 gliders in that nest box, they were trying to keep away from each other. They were hanging off the sides. Couldn't believe it. They must have been so hot. They construct these uh, nests of leaves that are spherical. They're, they're more open in summer, but during winter, they can they can fill the box right up and make their way right down into them. I've I've looked in boxes and can't see the gliders for the leaves. They're just burying themselves under layers of leaves. Uh, here's some example photos here of the various nests. I think the top left one's from my backyard, actually. And that nest box I put up in 1995, and it's still got gliders in it today. The entrance is a bit chewed up. I really should um, put a cover over it with a smaller entrance, but at the moment, they're still happy to use it. Are there any questions that I should be answering at this point? Yeah, Richard, um, someone has asked, is there a way to get involved with your spotlighting in the, the Yarra Valley or the Outer East? Uh, get involved. For people that are interested in in getting into this and having someone who can help them to um, learn and uh, help them get involved, I suggest the Victorian Field Naturalists Association. So the Victorian Field Naturalists Association, they're group of just interested people there's some very knowledgeable people qualified experienced people and they they just like to get out together and do stuff and they they go all over victoria i've been on many trips with them i was quite involved with them early in my career so yeah the victorian field naturalist association find like-minded people and they'll take you out and they have organized excursions so really good Good way to get involved. Thanks, Richard. We'll just posted a link. Oh, great. And really, any any nice patch of forest up in that Yarra catchment around Warburton, you go and stand in it, let it get dark, you'll hear all sorts of things around you from powerful owls to yellow belly gliders. Quite remarkable. We're very lucky to have such natural areas so close to where we live. And another question, uh, Richard, 
Uh, Adrian is, would love to chat more, and you may cover this further on, um, about insulative properties of nest boxes. Uh, they spent a year doing um, their honours on chainsaw hollows with many sugar gliders. Yeah, chainsaw hollows are cracking, um, but of course a bit labour intensive and not easy for most people to do in their backyards. I'm sure insulative properties are really important. Um, we're a bit limited with cost and practicality when we do nest box projects and hopefully we're just increasing the number of hollows available and making it easier for the animals to move through the landscape. But they do fill these boxes with leaves, so they do add a lot of insulation themselves. I'm sure we could do it better, but this is definitely a, uh, a cost-effective way to get get a habitat out in the landscape quickly and over wide areas. All right. So... Um, we, I said we get between, we get about tw up to 12 sugar gliders. Uh, well, not surprising, yes. Large numbers of nest boxes with entrances, too small for larger poss possums, has been found to increase the abundance. So putting up nest boxes with small entrances, so 35 mil diameter entrance has been found to increase the number of sugar gliders, which is hardly surprising. It's um, So nest boxes have been proven to be a really good way to boost local populations and to um, create hollows in habitat that's lacking, where hollows are lacking. Um, the higher the density of boxes, the lower the density of hollow bearing trees, the the more gliders you record in the boxes. It's a really um, distinct relationship. It, it shows that by putting nest boxes through the landscape, we can greatly increase the number of gliders. It they do have a preference. So some some studies have suggested that boxes placed on perhaps smaller trees um, and a on red box, yellow box, longleaf box, so the, the box eucalypts, nest boxes in box eucalypts tend to be more used, it would appear, so much better than an ornamental tree, an exotic tree. But if all you've got is an ornamental tree, then that's where you put your box. Um, a big study of 165 nest boxes in Bendigo uh, found 37% of those boxes were used by sugar gliders. And that's, there's been similar studies elsewhere. And in a project that I'm involved in, the Banyul Sugar Glider Project, we, we typically get about 25% occupancy of the boxes during the, the surveys. Um, it's, it's worth noting though that it's a, it's a study, that Banyul Sugar Glider Project. And some of those boxes are are in areas where you, you might not necessarily expect to get sugar gliders because there's not sufficient connectivity, but it's important for us to have boxes in those areas because it tells us um, where the habitat isn't, isn't available. So we can perhaps do something about that by planting some trees strategically to see if we can get that, that separation of trees down to 20 metres so that the gliders can move through the landscape. The project has actually found a direct link between tree spacing in the urban environment and nest box occupancy. And there's higher nest box occupancy near reserves. So what this project is identifying and what a nest box project can help us understand is the landscape around us. So what we're looking for is connectivity in the landscape. This is a diagram from, um, I can't remember which book this is from actually, I should have written that down. This is uh, this shows the different types of connectivity that we typically see in the landscape where you might have just a, 
a linear corridor along a roadside or along a creek, a very narrow strip surrounded by agricultural land or urban land with very few trees. Or you might have a series of separate reserves all largely connected or interacting with patches of bush on private land, a landscape corridor we call that. The patches are they're all there and they're all connected, but they might have slightly differing qualities. You might have treed areas with some grazing beneath next to a national park or a state forest and perhaps some timber harvesting. And then we've got the stepping stone corridors. Now, stepping stone corridors tend to be what we see in the greater Melbourne area, as well as these linear corridors. So linear corridors along our creeks and some of our roads and these stepping stones, they're like council pocket parks. You get the, the small conservation reserves that are in amongst our urban areas where the surrounding landscape may have plenty of houses, but there's trees amongst, amongst that area that provide some connectivity. So we tend to find that you get gliders in these pocket parks and nest boxes that are around them you get higher occupancy by gliders and then as you you move away you, your occupancy might drop off but it's still there interestingly we've found that the habitat corridors through our local area so this montmorency study is what i'm particularly referring to we found that there's definitely functional habitat corridors there I've even had one report of a lace monitor from the Plenty River, and I was emailed a photo, not this photo, of course, but I was emailed a photo of a what looked like a juvenile lace monitor that had managed to make its way to the Plenty River, uh, not far from the Yarra River. So it probably came down from the uh, somewhere in Nilambic, around the Bend of Isles or somewhere like that where they, they occur. It's an indication if we're getting large predators like that, then we have what we'd call functional habitat connectivity. This is a typical urban setting, typical urban reserve. This one's called Pex Dam in Montmorency. And this is where the Montmorency Biodiversity Group recorded their first sugar gliders in their, in their study. In fact, uh, over a couple of nights, we had about 50 people each night, a couple of weeks apart. They came to a, an evening event and the sugar gliders were very kind. It was like they were on the payroll. They actually did a glide from a yellow box tree over in the right of this photo here. They actually did a glide right across the top of the dam there, over the dam, and uh, onto a, a managum. Uh, outside the frame here on the left. So 100 people over a couple of nights got to see gliders gliding in their local area. There was plenty of oohs and ahs, I can tell you. Richard, yep. can I just ask a question? Um, someone's asked, is it just on the connectivity um, topic, is it crucial to have connectivity of less than 20 metres between reserves or will they travel over ground or suburb rooftops where necessary? Okay, I think this is this map here is probably a good way to explain Excellent. that. So well timed. Connectivity. So twenty meters is a, the distance between, say, trees or poles. That's the preferred distance because what gliders want to do is they want to glide between trees or between some kind of structure that's suitable tree-like structure, say a timber pole, they want to glide. They do not want to go to ground. It's one of the reasons they actually survive in our urban landscape. And I'll give you an example of surviving the urban landscape and a few more examples of connectivity. On this diagram here, this is actually Montmorency. This is the railway line along here. The larger green patches are patches of more dense tree canopy cover and most of these have got a, a council reserve area within them. 
the yellow dots are nest boxes where gliders have been recorded. So it's not surprising that we get them in these densely treed areas. But we've actually got them scattered right through the urban landscape. The blue are where gliders hadn't been recorded at the time this, this map was made. There's been, I probably need to update this map actually. We've got a few more that we can put in here. This project, um, at the time I did this map, there was about 100 boxes. There's now 400 boxes spread across from the Yarra River down to the south of this photo, up into Green Hills, uh, North Greensboro. It's a, quite a long way to the north here, following the uh, Plenty River. This is the Plenty River over here. The Diamond Creek is just out of frame over here. So the green lines represent where trees appear to be about the right spacing for gliders to move between them. And by move, I mean glide from tree to tree. And you can see the yellow dots suggest that that, that, that probably is the case. We're getting yellow, yellow dots along our green lines. So this is like an example of the, the stepping stone corridors, if you will, where we've got these patches of bush and we've got these linear con connections between them where the gliders are able to move. And they're, they're foraging out here. Um, they're, not just, they're not just moving between reserves, they're actually spending time in people's gardens. So um, if we've got a nice tall structure that a glider can take off from and glide, then they can glide further. But in this landscape, we don't tend to get such large trees, you know, in an urbanised environment. So they tend to go about 20 metres. And if they're gliding over a roof of a house, well, they can't, they can't allow their glide angle to go as low. Um, and they're going to be more wary in your urban landscape. They're going to be wanting to stay away from our cats and dogs. Unfortunately, as a, as a kid, one of my first interactions with sugar gliders was the neighbour's cat, which would regularly bring them to the house, or at least their tails, what was left of them. Okay. So the glider occupancy here suggests functional habitat connectivity. And by, by functional habitat connectivity, I mean the habitat, they can move through the landscape. They can move between um, areas where they can find a mate. They're able to get all the resources they need to persist. They've got food, they've got shelter. Um, so there must be other animals there. It's likely there's a range of other species that are also using the habitat. So these gliders are an indicator of, of habitat quality and availability. They suggest that we're going to have lots of insects, you know, invertebrates, some of which, of course, they rely on to eat. And then to be a range of birds that are also occurring in the same habitat and moving along these, these corridors, these habitat linkages. So there's multiple benefits from having these functional corridors. And Montmorency is known for the birds, the parrots in people's yards. Now, that image of the nest boxes, it looks fantastic and it is fantastic, but there are some issues that um, we have with nesting box projects and uh, that the Montmorency project, the Banyul Sugar Glider project, certainly come across these issues. And they've the group has really come up with some quite innovative solutions. So nest boxes do require maintenance. They're not like a hollow in a tree, you know. They they the timber is thinner. It can get impacted by. Um, cockatoos. Cockatoos can take a liking to chewing on nest boxes and they can destroy them quite quickly. I've seen lids get shredded quite quite quickly by uh, cockatoos. Putting the nest boxes up in the tree to begin with, there's risk involved in that because we have to use ladders. 
And so when we're talking about community groups with a range of abilities, that, that can be an issue. Not everyone can be involved in putting boxes up. And of course, if you're relying on ladders to check boxes, then not everyone can be involved in checking those those boxes. And in this world where um, we're very concerned about risk, we Banyul Council, who's very involved in this this Banyul this uh, sugar glider project, they did express a number of concerns about people up up ladders and how frequently people are going up ladders and that they were in council reserves, so council had a duty of care. And that's something that people should be aware of if they're planning on perhaps starting a nest box project. A bit different if it's in your backyard. It's easy enough to check a box by just sitting with a cup of tea on a chair, looking up at your box around dusk and waiting for something to come out. Usually you can tell if you've got a glider in a box in your yard because they they chew around the entrance. So the entrance gets evidence of activity by gliders pretty quickly. Um, the boxes do need to have their lids secured. So one solution to checking nest boxes without using a ladder and being able to involve more people, making it more accessible, is to use what's called a pole camera. And uh, the pole camera works really well, but you'd think you'd just open the lid and put the camera in and have a look, but the cameras aren't very good for opening, undoing latches. In fact, you could damage the camera if you tried to do that. And I'm, I'm really keen to keep the lids of these boxes closed. Other species like brush-tailed possums and ringtails, they're, they're pretty resourceful. And if they learn that they can open a lid, they'll, they'll use the box and... I do have concerns that brush tails would actually try and eat sugar gliders. And I, I don't think nesting box projects should really be providing food to brush tails. So the Banyul group came up with a, a particular way of um, overcoming this problem. They actually had a, a flap installed on the side of the box right up near the top. And that flap covers a hole. So that with the camera, on the pole, you just have to uh, push the flap to the side. You can see this is Jane Oldfield. She's uh, the convener of the Montmorency Biodiversity Group, and she she's the one who's responsible for getting the grants and making these projects happen. But you can see at the top here, this this is a camera on a pole, and you just push that flap aside, and you slide it in that hole. And she's looking at a screen there. Um, some of these cameras Bluetooth to your phone or um, there's a number of different types of cameras, but you can actually check the box from the ground. Um, so that makes it really quick and easy to check, which is important now that the group has 400 boxes up trees that need to be checked. Um, and it means that they can do it safely and anyone can be involved. So a really good solution there that to, that, that group came up with. There are other issues. I mean, we, we will always need to use uh, Sorry, Richard, I think you might have uh, hit the mute button. Are you able to unmute yourself? Sorry about there we that. Go. Excellent. Yep. I hit an arrow. Okay. Good. I'm back on. Um, so bees are a real problem. To try and overcome that, the, these boxes are designed to be relatively small, so not big enough to have a really functional beehive in. The thought is that if it's small enough, although bees might move in, they'll generally die out during winter because they, they don't have enough reserves um, of, of honey, uh, and in order to have a functional hive, they need to have a certain amount of area set aside for honey. Uh, so they die out, but that doesn't stop them trying. We do pack the box with fresh green eucalypt leaves when we first put it up. But, of course, the first thing that happens is the gliders get in there and they, they squish it all down and make their nest, which increases the area available in the box. So it becomes 
of attractive to bees. I've actually had one report from a a friend with a box in their backyard where they had bees go into their nest box during the day and sting the glider that was using it, and the glider came out during the day. So they they will evict, and these are not native species. These are the introduced honeybee, which is not a native to Victoria, but produces damn fine honey, of course. But these wild honeybees or feral honeybees, they're out there taking hollows away from our native species. And they are a problem, actually, for apiarists because having wild bees in the environment means that they harbour diseases to bees and and some insect pests for diseases. So having these wild bees, and we don't want our nest boxes to to harbour diseases that could affect um, apiarists who are making honey for a living. We Unfortunately, we do have to do something about the bees. So the group offers the bees to apiarists and they have people they contact to try and get the bees out, but it's not always practical for people to, to come and salvage the bees. So we do have to control them and we use a an insecticide or I use an insecticide called permethrin, which is derived from daisies actually. And uh, that actual flap that you put the camera in is quite useful for um, putting in the insecticide dust to remove the bees. The, the honey, of course, is quite attractive to the sugar gliders. So if we get rid of the bees, the gliders are pretty happy to move in and get into the honey. So although there are issues that have to be addressed and you should make sure you've you've come up with a plan before you start putting boxes up in your backyard or start a project, there are solutions. And these, these are the solutions of the pole camera is a really good one. Um, all right. So. Richard, just on the, yes. the camera topic, um, where can, uh, someone's asked where they, where they could obtain a camera. Is it a specialised pole camera? Yes, it, it is a specialised pole camera. There's only a couple of um, a couple of different types that are available, but they are available in Melbourne. I can provide you some information on that that maybe you could post after yeah. the talk. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, someone's just popped a link up as well, so that might be the same one. We'll cross-check that after. Great. No, oh, that's good. That's good. Um, uh, councils actually quite a few councils have these pole cameras now so if you have a community group it's worth talking to your local council you might well be able to borrow a camera that they have I know Banyal Council has them and well the Monty Biodiversity Group now has five or six I think all right so I mentioned the issue of gliding distance and that gliders, they really don't like to go to the ground. Um, they're very vulnerable on the ground. And so if trees are too far apart, they can't move between habitat. And so in our urban landscape, it's roads that tend to present these issues. And it's roads are, are difficult because it's very hard to have nice big trees regularly along some roads when when they might be six lanes wide with a very narrow median strip in the middle. One solution that's used for crossing roads for a number of wildlife is rope bridges, but rope bridges are not well used by sugar gliders and power lines similarly are not well used by sugar gliders. Um, if you can imagine, sugar gliders are a snack they're a, a, a nice size snack for a lot of owls and being out in the open would be very stressful for them. So they avoid um, those kinds of situations. Gliding nice and quick, one tree to another. And when they get to the tree, they move lightning fast. They are really speedy little guys. They run up trees, even massive managums that appear like a flat surface to them. 
they gallop up them at amazing speed. So rope bridges, although they've been used, that they're, they're not um, well used by gliders. Um, so in our urban landscape, we've got lots of barriers, and you can see examples here. Here there's possibly connectivity, but we haven't really been able to determine if they're using it. Definite barriers through here. Whereas we know there's gliders not far away that would like to like to cross these roads. This is an example of where there's some really good patches, but they're just gliders are unlikely to get across. So rope bridges are used by a number of possums that do climb from tree to tree that are that really have no other option. But as you can see, crossing something like a highway on a rope bridge, it's going to be it's going to be a long way for a very small glider, and they're just going to feel too vulnerable. That's that's they don't want to become lunch. So, what's been found is that if you put up a timber post and have it connected to tree canopy, gliders gliders are happy to use it. They treat them like dead trees. Best designs have these what we call launching sites. If you have them pointing directly towards the post on the other side, this is not an ideal one. It's kind of going out at an angle. I know when I watch gliders take off, they tend to get onto a branch and go straight off the end. They don't tend to jump off the side most of the time. They get a bearing. I mean, they're, they're leaping out into the dark. So they seem to use these branches like as a directional cue as to which way they go. And they repeat the same thing night after night. They use the same paths night after night, like clockwork. You can, you can set your watch by them sometimes. Um, the gliders in my backyard, certainly they come out within a minute or two of the same time each night. So there's been a lot of studies now of rope bridges and crossing structures, and it's been found that these gliding poles are really the way to go. And if, if you drive up the Hume Highway, you'll see there's been quite a number of them, very tall ones put up, to, up towards the northern end, up towards the Albury end of the highway, past Wangaratta, there's quite a number of these have been put up. And here's another example, trying to keep the distance right around that 20 metres. So they say about 12 metres high, you can get about a 20 metre span. This is one of the early ones. And again, they've got these launch pads off on an angle. They really should be pointing towards each other. We know better now. But it's from putting things up like this that we learn. So it's hopefully someone will modify this one in time. Excuse me, Richard. Someone's just yeah. asked if, if these poles are also used by squirrel gliders. Yeah, yeah. So apparently they're used by pretty much all the gliders. So squirrel gliders definitely use the poles. And I can imagine that um, all the species of gliders would would use these they're a real a real solution to that issue so in closing the the sugar glider projects and particularly the banyuk project that i've been involved in for six years now they provide the residents with that real connection to nature because people can, they get access to nest boxes that are subsidised. They get them in their backyard. They get to watch them. Their kids get to grow up with these boxes. And they help us to, to value the habitat in our, in our urban environment. Um, they're, they're such cute animals. They're a real, um, they're a really easy one to sell, I can tell you. They, uh, 
the local paper in um, Banyul has had photos of gliders on so many occasions now. It's been really great for the project. And the councillors have all come on board as well. So they're a great project for the community. We need to recognise that there are some issues, maintenance issues with boxes. So if you are thinking of putting a box up or, you know, you're in a community group and you're thinking of uh, starting a project, make sure you've you've addressed a number of those issues and you've spoken to council and council is supportive of the project before you get right into it. I'll show you a box now. Given I've spoken about them so much. So this is one of the boxes and this was made by the Eltham Men's Shed. So the Men's Shed were given a design and you can see what, what we've done here. And this is a box that I was lucky enough back in the mid nineties when I was at La Trobe Uni to get involved with the wildlife reserves and a group of like-minded people there. We did a nest box design project, which took about six months to really get a handle on. And this was our sugar glider design. And we had these getting used within three days in the wildlife reserves there. The key aspects of this design is the, the hole is down the bottom, and I'll show you why it's down the bottom soon, but um, it's also close to the tree. Back in the old days, we used to put holes on the outside of the box away from the tree, and that's, that's fine for a lot of animals like parrots and the like, but for possums, they want to go to the tree and climb out of the box and get into the box, and they want to do that quickly and easily because after all, there are predators out there. So having this hole close to the tree makes it attractive to the gliders. They find the hole easily. They don't have to climb around this box to find it. Now, it is down the bottom, and that's because we've designed this box to be specific to gliders. I'm going to move away from my microphone now briefly, but what I'm going to show you is um, there's an internal baffle in the box that the gliders have to climb over. I'll show you that. So the gliders actually go in through the entrance and the first thing they have to do is climb up over that baffle. Now, that means that birds aren't going to use this box because if they made a nest in that entrance hole there, they'd block the nest. The nest would block the entrance. What it does mean is the gliders are going to feel quite safe. They're going to feel safe because the hole is small They've gone in up over that baffle. They're going to be comfortable that nothing bigger than themselves is going to come in after them. They also, it's been suggested they don't really like drafts. Um, and uh, these boxes are quite thin. It's 12 mil ply. It's plantation ply that's FSC certified. So it's sustainable timber from plantations. It's not that thick, but it's not too bad, particularly when it's filled with um, leaves. But that having that baffle there does make it much more hospitable for the gliders. And I mentioned that um, there's a flap that enables the uh, camera to go in. So this was a sensational innovation by the biodiversity group in Monty. They really put their heads together to get this one. So there you go. It's quite simple. It just gets pushed aside and the camera can go in. Pretty cool. The um, the backing board is made from treated pine. So to prevent it rotting, because it's, it's going against a tree. So you need to use a timber that is going to be resistant to rot, given there'll be all sorts of bark and moisture running down the tree there. So you want it to survive. And... I've had these boxes last for 25 years on a tree, but um, as I mentioned earlier, the one in my backyard, which is one of the early prototypes, it does need some maintenance now because the gliders have just made the hole way too big. Have we got any more questions? 
We sure do. Um, people are asking about oh, brush tailed uh, fesago. Are they the same boxes able to be used? Yeah, yeah. So they do use the same box, um, though it has been suggested they do like a slightly larger box. Uh, we definitely have recorded them using the box, and you can tell the difference between sugar glider occupation and fasca gale occupation. Sugar gliders are really quite neat, um, and they use leaves, and pretty much only leaves in their nest. If you get a fasca gale in the nest box, you'll often find bits of bark in there, particularly stringy bark, red red stringy bark. Um, not as many leaves necessarily. And usually you'll find some other things. They, they'll they have some of last night's dinner, perhaps um, the wing of a bird, a few feathers will be in there. Uh, gliders aren't going to do that. And also a very noticeable difference. Fasca gales have what's called a, a latrine site. So in one corner of the nest box, it'll be their toilet and they'll be defecating there. So pretty obvious that you've got a fasca gale in your box. Great. And um, just some questions about birds. So do you, are Indian miners a problem? And also um, do native parrots like such as Rosellas use that same design? So we haven't had birds using these boxes at all. Yeah. Um, birds are a bit of an well, – Indian miners are an issue – in natural hollows, that's for sure, particularly because they'll put uh, plastic and foreign objects inside the hollow, which our native animals don't like, particularly our parrots. So um, they're an issue. But with these boxes, they've been actually very successful. We don't have birds using them. We've had fast, uh, a few like antichinus, yellow-footed antichinus using them. Um, bats, we occasionally get uh, bats using these boxes, um, but uh, no, no birds as such. Okay, and someone's asked, is recycled plastic a suitable material instead of wood or treated marine plywood? Mm. We've tried to avoid some of the treated marine ply just because of the glues that are used. We're not sure. I mean, they do, these gliders do chew the box. And um, marine ply is also a bit more expensive. Uh, so for these projects, we're trying to get a volume of boxes and this sustainable, this FSC certified plantation pine seems to be pretty good. It's low VOC, so low um, emissions um, and hopefully not toxic. Um, that's been really good. Um, the, the plastic, uh, that's an interesting one. I can't see why not. Um, I can't see why it wouldn't be suitable. Certainly durable. Um, yeah, I haven't tried it though. It's not cheap. Great. And uh, will gliders inhabit the same trees as possums? Yeah, yeah. You can get multiple different species using the same tree and that's pretty common um, in natural forest big old trees can have they're like a multi-story apartment block um, and you can have gliders and bats using the same hollows uh, gliders will go down and the bats will go up into the top um, and Multiple hollows can have multiple animals using them. Yes, that's for sure. I've seen that in nature. And it's. I have actually put multiple box types up in single trees and had them variously occupied over time. Yeah, for sure. Um, this one's actually from a bit earlier and it might be related to connectivity. So someone's asked what Max maximum distance would be needed for feather tails yeah um i'm not really clear on that i have watched feather tails glide their glide angle is quite remarkable um but uh it would depend on their their takeoff point 
but they are remarkably, they can glide a remarkably long distance. I, I'd have to look that up. Um, but, uh, yeah, they're quite amazing the way they move through the forest. Great. And are there any things we could keep or put inside to keep the boxes cooler in summer? Hmm. So must be well, <laughs> that's a good idea. Yeah, so putting it on the south side of the tree is often regarded as a good idea. What what I recommend um, is actually putting a few boxes up. So um, at my place, the boxes I've got, just because of the way the trees are in my yard, I've got most of my boxes are on the east side of the tree, so they get a bit of morning sun, um, but then they're shaded through the rest of the day. Um, and, yeah, one one box in particular as it's been occupied every time I've checked it in the last 25 years, um, any time of year, quite, quite amazing. Yet there's another box only like five metres away. It occasionally has one glider in it. I can't, I can't see why. Like the time I checked the box and there were 12 gliders in that box, the other box five metres away was empty. Like they were packing into one particular box. Why they like that box, I'm not sure but it's on the east side. I think having some on the south side, some on the north side. Um, in nature, they've got options, and most species have been found to move between nest sites um, and uh, variously occupy. I mean, I don't know whether I'm seeing the same individuals again and again or whether I'm seeing different individuals that are moving between um, their nest sites, or perhaps it's just because there's really very few hollows in my area these days because so many trees have been lost and not enough people have nest boxes up so maybe they don't have much choice mm. yeah and as, as sue's asked uh do the cameras on the poles have a white light that might disturb the gliders uh they do have a bit of illumination um the gliders they're remarkably tolerant uh, they don't seem to be particularly phased. I mean, when we check a box, we open. if we're not using a camera on a pole, we actually open the lid and look in. So we're definitely letting in plenty of light then. They're not always 100% comfortable with it, but they don't freak out. Um, on occasion, I, I've actually used nest boxes as an opportunity to... Um, collect gliders to get some photos and um, look at whether there's breeding happening in the area or not. So I've actually picked up gliders out of nest boxes and I should point out I've got a scientific research permit that enables me to do that. Don't do this at home, please. <laughs> um, so, and I've counted how many gliders are in a box. It can be quite hard to count how many are in a box without actually getting one or two out when they're all bundled together in a ball. We try and count heads or tails but um when you pick them up they're usually pretty calm um they don't really freak out they don't try and bite um unless you handle them for a while they're really quite a remarkably tolerant animal that uh do well in our urban environment so i don't think it stresses them out Great, thanks, Rich. Is there any more questions? I'll just give people a couple of minutes if they want to add any more questions. I have put web, web cameras in boxes so that I can watch gliders at night or during the day, see them coming and going. It can be quite addictive, actually. Uh, and I've used um, infrared light to do that, but I suspect that they can actually see the infrared spectrum. They are a night animal. So whether we use an, an infrared light source or a white light source, as long as it's dim, I think it's probably okay. Um, they didn't seem to mind uh, webcams that have used either uh, a, a dim white light or an infrared light. They definitely look at it. They look at the, at the light source. Um, so they definitely see it, but they go about their business. Um, they're quite funny to watch. Quite funny to watch. 
Okay, Anne, and just a couple more questions have popped up. Uh, we have a large property and would like to document the biodiversity. Do you know what permits they would need? Um, you don't necessarily need permits to document the biodiversity unless you are, say, wanting to do trapping in order to help. Um, and the nest box thing is a bit of a grey area that I, I haven't asked the question of, so I'm kind of letting sleeping dogs lie. You can put up nest boxes, and I believe you can check them, as long as you're not actually touching the animals. So, I mean, it's been so there've been nest boxes have been so widely used, and there's a range of other um, techniques you can use, like um, putting out cement pavers. Uh, wondering if I've got a photo of that. Um, concrete pavers, um, put out sheets of tin. You can put down roof tiles and attract wildlife so that you can document on your property. But, um, yes, you, you need a permit to actually handle animals and to trap. That's some great ideas, alternatives to net boxes. Um, and a couple of people are asking uh, how they are attached to the tree. We've posted a link about um, mm. this box construction, but I think they're curious about how they attach to the tree. That is a really good question. And it's one that's debated widely. I have a particular view about it, and it's it's my view about it. Um, so the, the options that are usually considered are do we use screws or nails? Using nails, of course, is a bit tricky because you have to hammer a nail into a tree. Whatever you use, it needs to be galvanised so that it doesn't isn't toxic to the tree and so that it actually lasts. Um, you don't want it to rust away too quickly. Um, I use nails because... Trees grow and they to, when they grow, they push against the nest box because they grow by growing outwards, putting on layer after layer, um, growing and shedding bark, but expanding outwards. And that puts pressure on the box, on the backboard here, pushing against it. Um, when I did the study, we, we saw a number of boxes had screws in them or nails in them that didn't have a washer. And those boxes actually started falling off trees after about 10 years because the trees would grow out and the box, if it's screwed, it can't move. So if you're going to use screws, you would want to have um, on the outside of the backboard, you would want to have a nice big washer and perhaps a big spacer, perhaps a bit of high density foam or something so if you have trouble hammering into a tree because it's it is it is quite hard particularly on some eucalypts they're quite dense and you are on a ladder um, you can use a nice big bit of foam you could do the same thing with a nail um, i've found that um, by having a nice big long nail and a nice big what we call a mudguard washer so we put the mudguard washer on the outside we put the nail through it the box can actually pull the nail out i do like to getting a bit technical here i do like to actually um, hammer the nail in only say two-thirds of the way in and then bend the nail up over the washer so that when the box pushes out it actually starts to bend the nail straight until it comes in contact with the washer after a while. But they are major considerations. Um, they're really good. It's a really good question. And um, if you screw it on too tight with, say, a roof screw, you may have to get up from time to time and loosen it to allow the tree to, to grow and the box to move with the tree as it grows. Yes. Great. A um, couple questions. One, are they found in the inner city? Um, and also, are they likely to be climate change impacts? 
for this species? Yeah, yeah, two good questions. So you find gliders along most of the creeks in Melbourne. So Yarrabind Park has sugar gliders um, and they, they're really dotted through. Um, the Darabin Creek has gliders along it. Um, so, yes, if you're in an area which has plenty of tree cover and not too far from one of the creek corridors that's well treed, you probably have gliders. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure about the Mary Creek system, though. There might be sections of it that do, certainly the Yarra River and the Darabin. Um, but uh, through, through Canterbury, yeah, most of those suburbs along those creek corridors have gliders. Yeah, you get gliders in Camberwell. It's bloody amazing. Um, as far as climate change goes, they, uh, you saw their range from right up in northern Australia, up near Cairns, up around Cairns, and down to Tasmania, from out in the out west on the border of Victoria and South Australia, up into the ranges. I think they're one of those species that's going to be less impacted by climate change. One of the major impacts, of course, is fires and frequent hot fires that can remove hollows from the landscape. Um, that That's where we'd see the impacts. And there's been a lot of talk about that, of course, after the terrible season we've had. Mm. Great. Um, a few people are asking about permits. So we've posted a link um, to a, a fact sheet which um, goes into that. Is it just to let people know um, it would probably be best to check out that link regarding permits. Um, and someone has asked specifically about a location. Woodridge Reserve help them? Oh, the yeah. Boxes there? Uh, look, I know of nest boxes in Beard Street that have sugar gliders. Um, Woodridge Reserve, I don't know whether it has sugar glider boxes in it, but um, I'm sure Nilambic Council would be able to advise. I think uh, there's a Nilambic Council person listening today, so they can probably, they may or may not know. Um, there are gliders, gliders in that area, though. So if you live near Woodridge Reserve and you put a box up, you'll probably get gliders. Great. I think they're very happy about Beard Street. There's This nest box is available commercially from La Trobe, um, the nursery at La Trobe. So I think they call it Mel Wild, the Wildlife Sanctuary. It's called these days, I believe, La Trobe Wildlife Sanctuary. Yeah. Great. And if people wanted to build their own, there's a um, we can probably provide them with a link. So if someone's asked if there's a link to the design. Yeah, I'm not sure if there's an exact link to the design. You okay. can buy you, they sell flat packs of the box. So um, if if you bought one of the flat packs, you could certainly make copies for yourself from that. Yeah, I haven't got the design drawn up. I usually just provide a box to someone who's making them, like the mel the men's shed. We gave them a box to copy. Sure. And I think this is one more question. We've got, uh, back to um, mounting the boxes. A strap anchoring is that an option? Well, straps go around a tree, and if the tree is alive. A strap's not going to be very good for it because trees, they need to move um, nutrients and water, well, mostly nutrients through the phloem vessel. So on the outside of a tree, it's really important that their vascular system can move um, sugars and starches between the roots and the shoot of the tree. So a strap's not going to be good. And as a tree grows, the strap's going to get tight and either break free or it will end up inside the tree, kind of the tree will grow around it, which is not going to be healthy for the tree. So straps are bad. 
no straps. Excellent. Okay, so I think we've got uh, those questions all out of the way. So thank you again, everyone, for typing in questions, and thank you very much to Richard for presenting today. So that was a fantastic presentation, and I'm sure everyone's giving you a big socially distanced uh, round of applause. <laughs> thank you very thank much. You. Thank you for the opportunity and sticking with it, everyone. I, I really enjoyed it.